Good morning. Welcome back to the Outreach of the Heart Ministries. I come to you live from Mile City, Montana this day. It's been quite a week, a record-setting week for me this week. Uh, 4,043 miles. That exceeds my previous record of 3,734 by, uh, what, 310 miles? So quite the week, um, drove in snow, drove in rain, drove in freezing fog, drove in extremely windy conditions, drove in beautiful conditions, uh, just your typical fall <laughs> driving conditions leading into winter time, I guess. So uh, it's great to be here. Great to be with you. Just a, a side note, I looked up this morning. Since the 10th of September, 9, 10, 24, in this truck, I've spent one weekend at home to deliver a message. The rest have been out on the road. Just shy of 24,000 miles have been logged. 23,793 since the 10th of September. So needless to say, the Lord gets me places, lots of places, lots of miles. But anyway, that's that's all just a side note. That's personal things uh, to give time for people to get on board here. But it's good to be here. Great to have you here. We're going to be discussing a, a topic this morning entitled Discouraged. Discouraged. Well, we've, we've talked about encouragement. We've talked about peace last week. We talked, but I, I had some people, some, well, a number of people actually this week contact me in one form or another saying that I just, I don't have that peace that you were talking about this past Sunday. Well, what do you have? Well, I feel discouraged. I feel discouraged rather than have that sense of peace. So we're going to talk about discouragement this morning. We're going to bring in some other, other words that uh, may be feeling separated or isolated or, you know, just some different synonyms maybe of of that word, discouraged. Would you join me in a word of prayer before we dive into God's word? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for safety and the many miles that uh, you allow me to travel in your name, Lord. I travel in your name, in your presence, in your guidance, in your direction, in your time frame. And Lord, it's, it's not about me, it's about you and getting from point A to point B, and the people that you put in my path along the way. Lord, I'm so grateful for that. Granted, there's there's times, Lord, that I encounter some people that I wished maybe I hadn't, but I still know that it is designed by you that I encounter them. So, Lord, I lift this message up to you, and I just ask your blessing upon it. Let them be your words and not mine. Let your humble servant bow away and let you speak through him, his voice, your words. And may those who hear have ears to hear and may you open their ears and their hearts and their minds to receive your word this day. Because we know, Lord, that many of us, many of us have faced times of discouragement. And many are facing that at this very moment. Speak your word into us, Lord. And may we take heed and do what your word says. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Well, we're going to start with a very well-known verse. Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. 
do not be afraid. Do not be what? Discouraged. That's where the title of this message comes from. Do not be discouraged. Why? Why is God telling us to not be discouraged? He goes on to say, For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Do you believe this? Believing this verse is the beginning of of overcoming discouragement. If you truly believe that God is where there, wherever you may go, that he is leading you or that you are following his lead. Now, if you're going astray and going your own way and not following what the Lord commands you, then that leaves room for discouragement. But if you believe that he is there and that he is guiding you and he goes before you, he's already there preparing for you before you ever get there. Now, that's a really difficult concept to to grasp. And to be able to even attempt to grasp it, we have to have hope, which we talked about a few weeks ago. We have to have faith that God is who he is and that God says what he means and what he says he will do. When he says he will do, he will act and he will do it. So what does this scripture say again? Have I not Suggested to you? No, that's not what he says. That's not what he says. How many of you that are watching right now can hear the sound? Give me a comment right now. Because I just got a comment that says that somebody can't get the sound. Are you able to hear? Well, I'm not getting any responses right now. So we'll we'll just go on here. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's the beginning of overcoming discouragement. We turn now to the New Testament where we find some more encouragement. Romans 8, 35. And I'm just going to give you a bunch of one-liners here, or one-verse groups, okay? I'm getting some responses here that say, I hear you. So uh, the one person that can't, it must be on your end. Romans eight thirty-five says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Now, why is this scripture included here? Because the word separate is there. Separate. A lot of people feel the discouragement set in because they feel isolated or they feel separated for whatever reason from God. But God's word tells us who shall separate us from the love of Christ. Who or what? It goes on to say, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness, the exposure of your sin, or danger, or sword. What is trying, what is attempting to separate you from the love of Christ? Can you determine what is trying to separate you from the love of Christ? Are you experiencing hardship? Are you experiencing persecution? Are you experiencing trouble of whatever shape or form? 
Are you experiencing a famine? Now, this doesn't just mean a famine of food and water. This could be a spiritual famine. Shall nakedness or the exposure of your sin separate you from the love of God? Or danger? We've got many, many dangers looming around us all the time. Is that separating you from the love of Christ? Is it the sword? The sword of the Spirit? The sword of truth? The Word of God? Is it separating you from Christ? Many people hear the Word and flee and run and allow the Word to separate them from Christ. I'm an example of that. I remember the first time God was ever referred to as Father. I was... I was soaking in the message in a in a high school youth group setting and and the leader that night referred to God as father and I got up and I ran away from that lesson literally left the room left the building went home and I didn't return for several weeks because I I didn't want to belong to a God who was like my earthly father. And over a period of time, it was revealed to me that God is not like any human father figure. He is much, much more. And that drew me back into the lessons. It drew me back and eventually led me into a relationship with Jesus where I stand to this day. But the word separated me from the love of God. It scared me and I ran. How many of you are fleeing from the word of God? How many of you are afraid to read the book of Daniel? Oh, sure, you'll read the about the Daniel and the lion's den. But what about the prophetic word for the end times? How many of you are afraid to read the book of Revelation? You don't want to know what's going to come upon this earth and the inhabitants of it. The word can separate you from God. And that separation from God or or from Jesus Christ will lead to discouragement. Can lead to a discouragement. I don't want to say will as in in all circumstances, but it can lead you into discouragement. We go back to the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, or Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21. See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your answers, told you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. God is giving an instruction for the Israelites to go and do. The Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, told you. The fulfillment of a prophecy or fulfillment of promises here. But God, even in that instance, had to encourage the Israelites. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Why? Because he's already there. He's the one that promised you this. I've encountered some folks in the last several weeks that have been discouraged because God's promises, they're not seeing God's promises be fulfilled in their own personal life. Well, that doesn't mean that God's promises are not being fulfilled. It just means that they're not being fulfilled in the way that you maybe want them to be. Maybe you want the result of this promise to look like this or to be this or to be that. 
But in God's sovereignty, he is fulfilling his promise in your life in this way or that way. Is that acceptable to you? Or do you become discouraged when it doesn't go, quote unquote, your way? So the fulfillment of promises and even prophecy can lead to discouragement because it's not going our way, quote unquote. We stay in the book of Deuteronomy and we go to the 31st chapters, Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8, another one-liner here. Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. This was a promise being made to Moses and to Joshua. But it's also a promise to us. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. We stay in the Old Testament. We go to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 22. Now I encourage you to turn to... 1 Chronicles chapter 22. This this begins the lengthier, more lengthy readings. 1 Chronicles chapter 22, beginning in verse 5. David said, My son Solomon is young and inexperienced, and the house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of all the nations. Therefore, I will make preparations for it. So David made extensive preparations before his death. Then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon in verse 7, My son, now listen closely to this. My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. But this word of the Lord came to me. You being David, the Lord speaking to David, you have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. But... You will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Solomon, and I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He, in verse 10, Solomon is the one who will build a house for my name. He will be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Beginning in verse 11 now, David is speaking to Solomon. Now, my son, the Lord be with you, and may you have success and build the house of the Lord your God, as he said you would. May the Lord give you discretion and understanding when he puts you in a command over Israel, so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Then you will have success if you are careful to observe the decrees and laws that the Lord gave Moses for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. We continue in verse 14. I have taken great pains to provide for the temple of the Lord, a hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver, quantities of bronze and iron too great to be weighed, and wood and stone, and you may add to them. You have many workers, stonecutters, masons, and carpenters, as well as those skilled in every kind of work, in gold and silver, bronze and iron, craftsmen beyond number. Now begin the work, and the Lord be with you. Verse 17, Then David ordered all the leaders of Israel to help his son Solomon. He said to them, 
Is not the Lord your God with you? As, and has he not granted you rest on every side? For he has given the inhabitants of the land into my hands, and the land is subject to the Lord and to his people. Now devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord your God. Begin to build the sanctuary of the Lord your God, so that you may bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the sacred articles belonging to God into the temple that will be, that will be built for the name of the Lord. Why is this scripture included here? Because sometimes we want to be the ones that do things for God. David wanted to build the temple for God. But God said, no, David, you have shed the blood of many people in my sight upon God's command. Don't, don't misunderstand that. David was not sinful in his slaughtering of people. It was God's command to go and do so. But now God is restricting him and saying, no, you are not to build the temple. It will be your son, Solomon. How many of us have ever become discouraged when we want to be the one that does something for the Lord and he says, no, somebody else will do it? That can be a form of discouragement. We know that some people are the seed planters. Some get the opportunity to come along and fertilize that seed and water that seed. And then there's others that will come along and participate in the harvest of that seed. That seed being the word of God planted in someone else's life. How many of us want to be the one who plants the seed, comes along and waters it and fertilizes it, and gets to reap the harvest of it, of that person that we're working with to harvest their soul, bring them into the kingdom of God. We can't save them. We know that. But we want to be the one that begins it and ends it as they transition from this world and death to sin to life through Jesus Christ and forgiveness and salvation. But we become discouraged. Well, Lord, I want to do this. I want to be the one that does this. Why do you give this? I did all the work. And now somebody else gets to take the credit for it. If that is our attitude in serving the Lord or living out our salvation, we are going to be discouraged more and more and more as time goes on. We need to rejoice in the times where God asks us to serve him and rejoice in that servanthood. Not allow that servanthood to discourage us when we can't do it our way. Our way, quote unquote. So sometimes what we want to do isn't designed or established for us to do it. So we need to open our eyes and trust that God is going before us and preparing something for us to do, something for us as an individual. God has chosen me to do this. Are your eyes open? Are you attentive to where God is leading you? Or are you becoming discouraged when you can't do what you want to do? In the book of Job, in the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 2. If someone ventures a word with you, will you be impatient? But who can keep from speaking? Think how you have instructed many, how... You have strengthened feeble hands. Your words have supported those who stumbled. You have strengthened faltering knees. But now, trouble comes upon you, or trouble comes to you, and you are what? 
discouraged. It strikes you, and you are dismayed. Should not your piety be your confidence and your blameless ways, your hope? Over the past several months, I've been engaging with people who are are living out right now Job chapter 5. Or Job chapter 4, verse 5. But now trouble comes to you. And you are discouraged. It strikes you, and you are dismayed. One of these individuals is a dear friend of mine that oh, I used to call on a regular basis and talk for hours with this friend. And then due to some illnesses and the process of aging in this world, she is now confined to a rest home, a care home. Trouble has come upon her. She is one that that fits this, this example. Think how you have instructed many, how you have strengthened feeble hands. She has done this for years. Your words have supported those who stumbled. You have strengthened faltering knees. This is what she has done for years and years and years. But now trouble comes upon you and you are discouraged. It strikes you and you are dismayed. It's hard for me to have a conversation with this person now because all I want to talk about is how they're being mistreated or, or treated indifferently in the place in which she now lives. She's discouraged. She's she's questioning her salvation. She Satan is attacking her from multiple facets. She's discouraged. Are you facing discouragement right now? I see a number of you that are listening. I know. I know that you are facing discouragement. Because some of you have shared that discouragement with you. Others have not. But discouragement creeps in. The question is, how long will it stay there? I'm concerned about this friend of mine in the care home that that discouragement has settled in so deep that as she continues to fade, her tent continues to disintegrate, her tent being her body. My concern is that she's going to pass from this earth, take her final breath here on this earth in a state of discouragement. Does that mean she isn't going to go to heaven? No, I'm not saying it's not. It's going to mean she won't go to heaven because she's discouraged. What it means is she's living her last days on this earth. Stricken by discouragement. Her joy is gone. Her faith is being tested. The peace that she once knew just doesn't exist right now. And it's really, really hard to watch. We stay in the book of, or in the Old Testament, we go to the, the book of Isaiah in the 42nd chapter. Beginning in verse 1, Isaiah 42, beginning in verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Who, Who is being spoken of here? This would be the Lord Jesus Christ. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break 
and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. This is what the God, the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk upon it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you be to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to set to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who, stu- who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. In verse 8, I will not yield my glory to another, or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. This is the announcement of his servant, Jesus Christ, his son. It's where John 3.16 comes into play. It's being foretold. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that anyone who shall believe in him will not, what, perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Verse 17 and 18 goes with it, where it talks about condemnation. God does not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world from him. Verse 18 paraphrase says that we stand condemned already. The only way that condemnation is removed is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, how much discouragement do we have in this world? Everything around us would discourage us. But Isaiah 42, chapter 42, tells us the humanity of Jesus. He will be a human being. He will be God in human form. And he will face the same things that we face. He will be led to discouragement, but he will not become discouraged. Why is this set of scripture so important to us? Because it gives us a focal point. Jesus also walked on this earth. Yes, he was God, but he was fully human. He had the emotional mindset as you and I. He was tempted by the evil one. He faced opposition. Trouble came his way. But he did not stumble. He did not become discouraged. Let's look at some examples. Examples of being discouraged. So we know that God led the the Israelites out of Egypt, right? We know about the plagues that God sent upon the Egyptians that brought light that God is who God is. And eventually, Pharaoh let the Israelites go. But then he chased after them. He sent his army after them. The Israelites, as we read through their time in wandering in the desert for 40 years, often spoke of wanting to return to Egypt, to return back to captivity, to slavery. Now, what what are some things that they experienced? They watched the Red Sea be parted before their very eyes. They walked across on dry land. And when the last Israelite stepped out of the sea, the wall of the sea, the walls came crashing in. 
and the Egyptian army was drowned. So the Red Sea was parted. They were led by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. How many people living today want to be led by a pillar of a cloud at night and a pillar of light by day? So that we know our way. We can just follow the cloud. We can follow the pillar of fire. We, we know exactly where we're going. But God took that away, did he not? So what is the pillar of the cloud? What is the pillar of fire that leads us now? It is his word. But people aren't diving into God's word. They're not reading. They're not studying. They're, they're not even listening to God's word. But yet they want God to lead them. His word leads us everywhere he wants us to go. God provided manna and quail. God provided water coming out of the rocks. There was another time where the Israelites were instructed that they were they were to overthrow the, the city of of Jericho, right? But the walls around the city of Jericho were so tall. They and impenetrable. So what did God tell them to do? March around the city. How many times? Seven times. And on the day that you march around there on the sixth time, Go ahead and go around there also on the seventh for the seventh time on that same day. So on that day, you march around the sixth time you've been around it. And when you've completed that march, you begin the seventh march. And what happened to the walls of Jericho? They crumbled and they fell. But how discouraging would that have been? You're anticipating the work of the Lord. And on day one, you see nothing happen. Day two, you see nothing happen. Day three, and your march around saw nothing happen. Day four, day five, day six, still nothing is happening. But then you finally do what the Lord commanded on march around that seventh time. Do you think that the people were encouraged to walk around that seventh time? Or do you think that they were discouraged? right up until the point that the walls begin to fall. How many times have we been looking forward to something that we believe the Lord is going to do, He's going to fulfill His promise, but yet we become discouraged in the midst of it? Now, thankfully, the Israelites continued to, to march. I don't believe all of them did, though. I think there were many that said, I've done, I'm done, I've, I've had enough. This is nonsense. This is foolishness. We're putting our lives at risk marching around this, this wall. For what reason? If God was going to do it, he would have already done it. You know, think about those examples from your own life. And what's led you to discouragement. In 1 Samuel, First Samuel chapter 8, I want, to, I want you to turn there with me. 1 Samuel chapter 8. I'm going to give you just a moment. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Beginning in verse 1. We're going to read 22 verses here. So basically all of chapter 8. First Samuel chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, 
and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and ascribed or and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Verse 4, So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a what? A king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. So what do we have happening here? The Israelites are discouraged. They're discouraged because they've got two new leaders that are not following the same ways that Samuel followed. They're not following the Lord. They're they have turned aside after dishonest gain. These two leaders, these two sons of Samuel. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Things are not as they should be. But who do the Israelites turn to? They go to Samuel and say, Samuel, you need to establish a king, a kingship to rule over us. We don't want these two Yahoo brothers or sons of yours anymore. We want a king. Well, how many times has God proclaimed that he himself is king over Israel? That God is the king of Israel? Over and over and over. Verse 7, And the Lord told Samuel, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you as well. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Now we begin in verse 10. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and still others will make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfume, perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you on that day or in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the Lord had said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. 
here in America, where there's a lot of discouragement going on. We've got an election coming up here in just two days. Two days from now, we have an election. We have an election to put into place what other countries would maybe refer to as a king. We call it a president, a leader of the nation. And the leader of this nation, the president, has become so much more important to so many people than the Lord our God. People who say and cry out, God bless the United States of America. God is not going to bless the United States of America when people are searching for the blessing through a leader other than God. We have a very crucial decision to make this year as a body of believers, as those who profess the name of Jesus Christ. Neither of the candidates are perfect in any way, but neither are we. But on one side, I see evil. I see someone who has stood behind a pulpit and referenced the word of God, spoke the word of God, out of context, twisted it, turned it, fabricated it to make it into, I won't say the name, but I will refer to the gender, to her liking. That is blasphemy against God. That is grieving the Holy Spirit. And as I watched her do this, my heart cried out, on her behalf because of the punishment that she will one day receive. And the leaders of that congregation in which she stood before are going to face judgment, unbelievable judgment by the Lord our God. And they're not even aware of it. And when a young person stood up in that group and attested to the to the truth, stood against the lie that was being taught and stood for the truth. His voice was covered up by the noise of the congregation, the noise of the praise band, and the noise of the one who was doing the speaking from the pulpit. And that young person was eventually escorted out of the building. Discouragement leads people to do things that are out of God's context, that are far beyond God, that are actually anti-God. Because discouragement encourages us or leads us to do things of our own free will rather than God's will. Jesus witnessed that firsthand. The people did their will, which we know in all perspective was God's will for Jesus to be hung on that crucifixion cross. But it was that generation, those spiritual leaders, who sought to destroy the word of God, Jesus Christ. And they succeeded, or so they thought. Scripture was just fulfilled. The promises of God were fulfilled as Jesus hung on that cross and died and was removed and buried and on the third day rose again, just as Scripture had foretold. So Satan seeks to discourage us. The discouragement is coming from Satan. And for those of you who do not want to engage in spiritual understanding, 
understanding of the spiritual warfare that goes on, that do not want to engulf themselves in the teaching of angels and demons and the warfare that, it, that occurs. When discouragement comes, you won't understand where it's actually coming from. But it's coming from Satan. Satan is seeking to discourage us because it separates us from God. Because of our choices, we separate ourselves from God. God does not separate us himself from us, but we separate ourselves from him in the midst of discouragement. So Satan is trying to discourage us from doing things in the name of the Lord, right? Or in the will of the Lord. Do your own thing. Do your own. Be who you want to be. Some synonyms here would be words such as to deter. To deter us from doing what God wants us to do. And doing what we want to do. To inhibit or restrict us from doing what God wants us to do. I think of the example there with Paul wanting to go into regions that God did not want him to go to yet. Because he had a man at Macedonia that was calling out for him. And God wanted Paul to go to Macedonia, not over into other regions. God used the, the power of the Holy Spirit to deter him to inhibit him from crossing over into this other region. So God can use deterrence. He can inhibit us. But when he does it, it's done in such a way that it's not a discouragement. It's an encouragement. It's an encouragement. How many of you have felt the encouragement of the Lord to go and do something for him. How many of you felt the discouragement of Satan to go and do something for yourself rather than for God? Another word there could be the word divert. We're divor diverted when we become deceived. And we're deceived by the works of Satan, the evil one. Another example of discouragement could be found in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden your face, his face from you, so that he will not hear you. God can use that script, those two scriptures as, a, as scriptures of encouragement to turn your eyes upon him. To repent of your wicked ways. To seek the Lord while he may be found. But yet, Satan can use those same verses and say, you'll never measure up. You're a sinner and God's eyes are turned from you. You will never see salvation. See how the evil one works? In the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 16, verse 21. Separate yourselves from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. Maybe you are associated with people that are leading you to discouragement. It could be your church family is leading you to discouragement. It could be your pastor that's leading you to discouragement. It could be your spouse, your 
your friend, your, your children, a family member, a co-worker, whoever it may be. What does God's word say here? Separate yourself from that person so that he can do what he needs to do. Or that group of people so that he, God, can do what he needs to do to that group of people. Now, there's some teaching out there in this world today, some uh, some well-known, I want to call them lunatics, activists, that are, are preaching to young children that if your parents don't go along with your thoughts and your desires and what you want to do with your body, they do not support your choices, separate yourselves from them. That's not what this is talking about. This isn't promoting that. That is an evil promotion. It's trying to tear apart the nuclear family even more than it already is. What God is telling us here is revealed. It says, separate yourselves from the assembly. Well, if the word of God is not being preached to you, where you assemble for worship, separate yourselves from that place. The church in Pennsylvania where this female candidate for president spoke from the pulpit. God's word to those people would be to flee. The one person who stood up in opposition to the false teaching was escorted out of the building. Praise the Lord that that person was escorted out rather than them sitting back down and accepting what was being taught, like the rest of the congregation was doing. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter thirteen or fifteen. First Corinthians fifteen verse thirty three. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. That is what God is saying. Separate yourselves from that assembly. Bad company disrupts good character. If you are falling into discouragement because of the people that you're hanging around with, remove yourself from those people. Yeah, but Stace, I'm hanging around with them so that I can encourage them to come to know the Lord. What does God's word say? Be very careful in the process of doing that. Because you too may become tempted. And if you're feeling the, the discouragement as you're trying to minister to others, You shouldn't be ministering to those people. God will bring people into them, those people's lives that will not become discouraged. That will stand on the word of God. That understand that discouragement comes from the evil one. The key word here is, or the key thought there here is, even though you desperately want to do it because you think it is the right thing that God has called you to do this and you're going to do it, maybe you're misunderstanding God. But we become so prideful, determined, that it's hard for us to step away sometimes until we come to the, the fact that discouragement is is building in us. So I'm going to make three statements here. Maybe four. So you are discouraged. Question mark. So you feel separated from God. Question mark. So you feel isolated or 
feel that you just don't fit in? Question mark. And you're asking, what do I do? What do I do? Question mark. Well, my friends, you're not going to like the answer that God's Word gives. You're not going to like the answer that God's Word gives. We're going to turn to the book of James. We're going to turn to the book of James. Once I find it, I want you to turn there as well. To the book of James. James is right after Hebrews. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The answer to you are discouraged. Am I discouraged? Am I feeling separated from God? I'm feeling isolated and I just don't fit in. What is the answer to this? What do I do? We Read God's Word, accept God's Word as the truth, and let it speak into us and change our hearts, our minds, our attitudes, and our outlook on life. When we do what verse 2 says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. If we consider that pure joy, we will not fall into discouragement. It's not easy to consider it pure joy, though, is it? Unless we get the understanding that these trials of many kinds are actually coming from the Lord. Because you know that the testing which is coming from the Lord tempting is coming from Satan. So when we read this testing of your faith, it is not Satan testing your faith. It is God testing your faith. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Why is perseverance important? <coughs> Verse 4, let perseverance finish its work so that you may become mature and complete, not lacking anything. So we need to let joy overtake us. Now, this is not the same type of joy that was spoken about at a particular um, nominee's party um, celebration. Okay? Or a convention. That joy was sickening. That joy was about all that we can do ourselves. We don't need God. It was a, a joy that separates us from God, which is no joy at all. That is discouragement. Every time the word joy was spoken at the convention and the days that followed should have been replaced with the word discouragement. James 1.12 Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Are you discouraged because you're facing these multiple trials? You're being tested by God. Are you discouraged because you don't get to do what you want to do? 
but must, as instructed by God's word, do his will and not your own. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. Don't, do not be deceived. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us, what? What is that word? Birth. Through what? The word of truth. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. The lies is what discourages us. The lies that we believe, the lies coming from the evil one is what discourages us. But God has chosen to give us life, to give us birth, that rebirth, through his word. We go on down to verse 22. Do not merely listen to this word and so deceive yourselves, but do what? Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like and becomes discouraged. My word's not here. If we are not doing what the word of God says, we will fall into discouragement. We hear the word, we read the word, we see the word. We know the word, but when we don't put it into practice, what happens? We become deceived by the evil one, and we fall into discouragement. Verse 25 says, But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. They will be blessed in what they do. Do what the word says, friends. And you will not fall into discouragement. And we close out of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. How important is the word of God to you? Is it important to do what it says? Or do you read the word, hear the word, understand the word, and then just let it go? Not putting it into practice? Where is your birth in the sense of the word? Where is your life through the word? Without it, my friends, you will not have the peace that we talked about last week. But instead, you will have discouragement. You will feel isolated. You will feel separated from the love of God. Not by His choosing, but by your own. So what do we do? When we feel discouraged. We accept. The testing of our faith. And we accept it. With pure joy. 
My friends, if God never tested us, who would we be? Each time that God tests us, He is attempting through His Word, which is sharper than any double-edged sword. And doing what? What does the Word do? Hebrews 4.12 again. The Word judges the thoughts and the attitudes of of the heart. Each time God tests you, He is trying to cleanse you of discouragement. He is trying to cleanse you of what Satan has established in you. He is trying to Reveal to you the very thoughts and the attitudes of your heart. I ask you this day, what are the thoughts of your heart? Are, your, are the thoughts of your heart about all the things that are going on around you? Are they about this upcoming presidential election and what's going to happen to this country if a certain person wins and what's going to happen if uh, another person wins? Have we put our trust in a king? An earthly king? Or are the thoughts of our hearts focused on God and the establishment of of Jesus Christ as our King. What is the attitude of our heart? Have we thrown our hands in the air and said, it it just doesn't matter anymore? We're lost. This country's done and over with. Or my marriage is done and over with. My relationship with with my child or my parent is is done and over with. Oh, poor me, oh, poor me. Just isn't worth it anymore. My friends, if that's the attitude of your heart, you are in full-on discouragement. And Satan is winning the battle. But God, if you will reach out to him, we'll win that battle on your behalf. So we have a lot of choices to make. What will you choose? Will you choose the peace that we discussed last week? Or will you wallow in your discouragement? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for this message. I thank you for this time together with you. Oh, Lord, lead us from this discouragement. We're here and just, Lord, you tell us you love us. Some will even say you love us just the way we are. But we also know that you love us enough to not leave us where we are. Many of us, Lord, are are just wallowing in self-pity and discouragement. Feeling separated, feeling isolated, feeling as though we don't fit in. Or just let your word speak to us this day. Through this message. And may the words that you have spoken here. May we put them into practice. If we're around people that discourage us, help us to separate ourselves from them. Help us to answer the questions. What do I do, Lord? What do I do? And how do I do it? 
I thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.